Hi everyone, welcome to Cold War Spaces. This is actually our last and I believe 53rd interview in the series. Um, and we have a very special topic today. It's called Animation Space, the multinationalism, multinationalism and the Soviet animation industry. And our guest is Maya Balakirsky Katz. She's a psychoanalyst and the Associate Professor of Jewish Art at bar -Ilan University. She's co-editor of the journal Images, a journal of Jewish art and visual culture. And she has a forthcoming book titled Freud, Religion and the Birth of the Psychoanalytic Periodical from Cambridge University Press. Uh, but today she'll be talking about her 2016 book and that was called Drawing the Iron Curtain, Jews in the Golden Age of Soviet Animation. This program will be about 30 minutes between our guests and you Siegel, the vendor's chief curator and director of programming. And then we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please put your questions in the Q&A box during that time and keep them short and concise, no longer than a sentence or two so that we can try to get to everyone. And as we're getting started, you can say hi in the chat. I already see some messages there. Um, and it's nice to see what city you're tuning in from as well. And remember to switch the recipient so it says, to everyone, not just to hosts and panelists, so that everyone can see. Afterwards, we'll be posting the recording of this program on our Vimeo page and also in podcast forum on our SoundCloud. And lastly, I want to thank Susan Horwitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and our virtual program. And I'll hand it off to you to begin the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna Rose. And Maya, welcome to our final uh, interview uh, in the Cold War Spaces uh, series. So wonderful to have you. I'm so honored. And uh, yeah, that it's been like just an amazing year with all of your programming. Thank you so much. So let's uh, immediately dive in. And I would like to um, start with an observation that so many historians and art historians consider Soviet art and Soviet culture to be just um, uh, propaganda tools without any artistic merit. merit. But you um, um, researched Soviet animation, and I'm very curious to hear how you would interpret that ju judgment uh, of Soviet culture in general, focusing on animation. Well, uh, you know, I was, I was one of the people who had that opinion because I went to Bryn Mawr for a PhD in art history. And that is what I was told. You cannot do serious work. First of all, you can't do serious work in Jewish art because there's no such thing. But Soviet Jewish art is like completely impossible because it's like all propaganda. So, you know, I mean, you were allowed to do dissident underground artists who, you know, especially the first ones who came to, uh, to America as emigres and um, refuseniks, you were allowed, you were sort of allowed to do that. So when I saw, I mean, always like with my books, my last chapter is, is, is the thing that got me started. And I watched Yuri Norstein's film, Skaska Spazik, Tale of Tales, which is your movie of the week. Right. And I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> I just kept watching. I'm like, what do you, wait, I don't understand. This was done in the animation studio. Wait, did he get fired? I, I, like, you know, there, were, there was just like a lot of, a lot of confusion about everything that like my preconceptions and what I was seeing. And uh, I started, I started, you know, watching actual films because I grew up with them. But I mean, I thought those were my films. I didn't realize like there was a whole nation that was watching them. And I discovered that, you know, it, it was very cutting edge that um, Soviet animation, unlike American animation, was coming through the fine arts departments. It wasn't coming through like comics and, you know, um, uh, kind of lay, lay artists. It was coming from people who were graduating Moscow's art schools and, you uh, and it was really just eye-opening for me. So opening new layers of history there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, censorship here. Of course, um, uh, the Soviet arts were controlled, sometimes strictly controlled, sometimes less uh, strictly. Uh, what can you say about the limitations for animation artists due to censorship? Were there clear directives or uh, limitations? What was the situation? 
Well, it's, of course, it depends on the decade. And, uh, you know, when animation first started, um, well, it first started before the revolution, but, the, but that got quashed right at the revolution because those, those you know, Starevich was seen as like, you know, walking on uh, non-ideological ground. And then when it started in the 20s, it was really uh, grassroots. And all the animators were basically doing every part of the animation, um, they, you know, from writing the libretto to um, to doing the storyboards to drawing to scoring the films. Um, once there were more state controls, especially after the consolidation of all these little shops into one big mega studio in Moscow, uh, there were there were many many annual plans and uh, quotas and production rules. And the artistic council had to approve everything. But you know, the number one thing about that is that it kept changing. And uh, therefore, you know, it's just kind of like tax law in America. Like the minute you have a tax law, everyone like, you know, kind of like piles in on it to try to like understand what this would mean. So since it was changing all the time, they were really able to uh, take the challenge and, and create based on, based on uh, you know, the new rules, but they really weren't cynical. I mean, they understood that they had to play the system in terms of censorship. You know, they had to put things into the film just so that later they could take it out so that the censors were happy, you know, so they had to stick right. in kind of low hanging fruit but they were very not cynical about their art. And, right. um, and there were all sorts of, all sorts of, you know, kind of establishment things. And I call it in my book, horizontal, um, uh, horizontal structures as, as so that we're not only thinking about vertical structures with like the sensors on top, mm -hmm. you know, um, all the artists, especially, you know, like kind of the tenured artists, the directors were sitting on the artistic council um, and they were also playing the game, but uh, there were there were ways of creating director groups, and there were ways of like getting through the system, and everybody kind of like had to play the game. And if you really want to kind of see this happening, um, uh, Fyodor Hithruk made a film called Film, 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 mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. It's like basically a satire on what it takes to make a film. Um, so, you know, and, th and that was a very popular film, but right. at the end of the day, you wanted a beautiful film and, right. you know, frankly, they really felt like that kind of ideological censorship was nothing compared to the market censorship that we have in the States that we have to worry about box office and like television ratings and that that was much more, you know, a killer on aesthetics than having to play the system. You know, they didn't they didn't have to produce viewers. Right. Would you say that uh, censorship in the animation industry was uh, in some ways less strict or more liberal than in other art forms? Or do we just tend to over interpret the role of censorship in the Soviet arts in general? You know, People ask me like, why did you do like, like, why were there so many Jews in Soviet animation? Because I'm coming from Jewish studies, so it was like just one of the things was that it was fascinating for me to see that this labor force was so multicultural, not not just Jews, but all sorts of minorities, and um, and the answer is is that yes, but that's because they couldn't really, you know, they were trained to be sculptors, they couldn't really go into sculpture. They were trained as architects. They couldn't really go into architecture, fine art, painting, you know, and, and there were so many more limitations in those fields, including live action film, that animation ended up being kind of like um, a safe haven and a center of art. But no, I mean, that's because, you know, it, it, you trickle down all the way to the bottom. Right. And at the bottom, they made it one of the greatest art forms of the Soviet culture. But right. You know, you do have to kind of acknowledge that it's not as if it was like all, you know, roses. A lot, a lot of these artists were planning on being fine artists. Yeah, I understand. 
And uh, actually, uh, and as you describe in your book, animation became immensely popular in the Soviet Union. Do you have an explanation for that? Why did so many people want to see animation? And was it in a sense even maybe more popular than feature films? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so, so first of all, I mean, I think that in the beginning in the 20s, uh, there was some real avant-garde um, animation that wasn't very populist, but there was a big film that that America that the Soviet Union um, advertised that they were doing of American racism. Uh, and they advertised it all over that we're making a, a huge film, like by Eisenstein, Kudovkin. We're making a huge film to, to chronicle American racism. And they brought 22 African American actors uh, to Moscow. And they, it was going to be like, like the, you know, like an expose, like you can't imagine. It was going to, it was going to bring revolution to America and American racism. And when they got there, you know, Langston Hughes was one of the was one of the um, main people there. Also, uh, Lewis Thompson, Dorothy West, and uh, James Patterson. And you know, the, the the Soviet directors they were like, okay, you're gonna sing, you're gonna dance, and also we're gonna have to like put a little black face on your face because we don't understand why you're so light. And they were like, we don't dance, <laughs> we don't sing. <laughs> and we're fine. <laughs> and um, and there, there was just like a lot, first of all, a lot of misunderstanding. Langston Hughes writes a very sad memoir about it, even as he's trying to very much uh, not make it seem like a failure back in like the in America, because, you know, it, it was such a disappointment. So he's he had his own censorship issues over there. Um, and they, they really parted. Uh, in kind of a sense of failure. But what Langston Hughes never mentions, I think because in America, um, you know, animation was seen as, as so derogatory to ethnic minorities and just such low brow. What he doesn't mention is that they did make a film and it was an animated film and it was a five minute short, but it was very powerful. And, uh, and uh, it was, part of the reason it was successful for the Soviet side is because they were able to universalize suffering and which is what they wanted to do. Right. And, uh, and this really caught the attention of Stalin who said, oh, with animation, we could like literally do whatever we want, you know, live action that has all kinds of limitations. So they really poured a lot of love and attention into the studio and uh, gave them a lot of leeway and uh, allowed them to hire a lot of creative personnel. and you know, it kind of took off after 19, you know, in the 1930s. But after the war, when the country was just so devastated, um, Soviet animation was one of the few places that they funded when everything else kind of in terms of culture fell to the wayside because they needed to rehabilitate um, and just to rebuild. Uh, Soviet animation was seen as like kind of a part of the cure. Soft, moral, mm -hmm innocent, loving to, to kind of create just just to heal. So in that sense, also it was seen as kind of like part of the post-war healing right. that the nation needed to do. And of course, also because of its very rich imagination. And uh, I imagine. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, international um, uh, impact of uh, Soviet animation. Many cultural historians have commented on Western influences in the Soviet bloc countries, but of course, there's also a story to be told about the other direction. And I guess, especially uh, when you talk about Soviet animation and its impact in the West, for instance, in the Disney studios, there's a rich uh, story to tell. Can you say something about uh, how Soviet animation influenced animation in the West? I'm not remembering this part of, of, of my research because I feel like it goes so much more the other way is that is that not so much that 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 you know like they sent Smirnoff off to Disney, Victor Smirnoff off to Disney to like figure out what they could do over there. 
And he brought back um, Lucille Kramer, who is an employee at Disney, who was supposed to like teach the Soviet animators all about like cell, you know, cell animation and departmentalization, specialization. And, uh, and it was in rejecting the Disney style for wanting something indigenous that was so powerful to Soviet animation. Mm -hmm. And it really was a domestic product. They weren't looking, to, I mean, they, they did send things out, they did, but they weren't, it wasn't one of the media that they were making for propaganda, like outside of the nation. It was really domestically oriented. Yeah, but on, at the same time, you also describe how some of these animated films won international prizes in Western Europe, etc., and were really recognized, even sometimes without the makers and directors knowing about those prizes, right? Yeah. Yes, so, so that's already not Disney, right? Because now we're talking no, 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 about sure. the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So now yeah. we're talking about the influence that they had on kind of cult animation in America. And, uh, and, and yeah, absolutely. The, the, you know, the, the film festivals uh, is where people learned about Soviet animation. And I would say, like, if we go really back, like, I guess the first, the first inkling of that was the 1954 International Animation Festival that was held when, uh, you know, I think I think that that um, Indian animation ended up uh, getting getting um, Soviet animators to come and give them, uh, uh, you know, uh, support and. Uh, and certainly the Moscow studio ended up in the 50s and 60s going out to all the different republic republics and teaching them how to run animation studios. And they were the largest uh, animation studio in the entire Eastern Europe. So, you know, uh, there, there was, there was, they were always looking at Sayus mode film. But um, in, ter in terms of, yeah, I, I'm just not sure in terms of Disney. I would, I would have to like think about that somewhere. That's that's fine. So, but yes, uh, in, in nineteen in nineteen eighty, Yuri Norstein's Tale of Tales, Spaska Spaza, was nominated number one most important animated film of all history. This was like you know he, he jokes around that he was the only representative of the Soviet Union <laughs> at the Olympics because it was like held right next to the Olympics and 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 the Soviet Union had boycotted that year. Um, and, you know, he's kept that title all these years, uh, really kind of, uh, you know, influenced so much of a tour uh, animation. Right. And Yuri Norstein, of course, was a Jewish director. And you mentioned in your book that people engaged in the animation industry, and that included, uh, for instance, uh, not only directors, but also artists, uh, composers, writers, actors, puppet makers, camera people, etc. And uh, many of them were Jewish. Um, you already hinted at it, but how do you explain this large amount of Jewish people in the industry? Uh, so again, like taking a long view, I would say like in the beginning with like the Koreanizatsia uh, policies, which was the promotion of non-Russian Soviet citizens in the state culture, uh, was was very good for minorities. Number two, that with the revolution and the Russian Civil War uh, between 1917 and 1921. We see this influx, this domestic migration from the former Pale of Settlement, which is where the majority of Jews lived, to the big cities, right. and um, and so they you know, they were looking for work, and uh, and they, you know, many of them did have backgrounds in artisan um, uh, fields and in art schools. Jews were going into art schools already, and and in all sorts of uh, you know, printing press, lithography, the, these were kind of like the, the, the big fields that were in the Pale of Settlement, which they had monopolies on because it was, it was Jews living amongst Jews. So once, once like the first Jews were hired into the, um, into the staff, 
they were able, they had a lot of control over who they chose for their director groups. So directors had a lot of, a lot of leeway on that. They weren't assigned partners. Um, so, you know, artists, um, you know, especially like the Broomberg sisters who were like amongst some of the first women in world animation were two Jewish sisters who saved a lot of artists in Moscow from like um, not having work, you know, being unemployed in Russia. You know, like a lot of times me and my friends like talk about like, should we stay home with our children? All this angst about being a stay at home mom. And uh, my mom was always like, I don't understand if you don't work, you go to Gulag. Like what, the, you know, like, so, so since you mm -hmm. had to work, uh, Sayuz Monfilm did end up kind of being a safe haven for freelancers that they didn't quite have a job, but they were able to work on projects and directors corralled, you know, their own. Right. And would you say that um, um, this uh, relatively high number of Jewish people also translated itself into content? Uh, was the Jewish experience part of uh, the stories of an animated films? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Can you give an example? Or yeah, yeah, or, no, I'm thinking. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure, thinking. sure, yeah. But, uh, you know, since, since I've written the book, I've had, you know, many Russian Jews come and tell me, you know, um, you know, uh, about about their experiences um but one of the you know one of so one of the things is that i heard from everybody kind of like from everyone i spoke with is this idea of sitting at the end of the animation to see the names go down that there was a sense of pride so so just the experience of feeling like there were jews in soviet culture was a place of pride it wasn't as if these same jews were encoding or like sticking it in, in like secret ways. You know, it wasn't like that at all. They, they, they were proud Soviet Jews who wanted to create a Soviet culture that was inclusive to the Jewish experience. So my favorite example is, um, is like the Soviet Mickey Mouse, Chubarashka, who, you know, it's like everyone knows Mickey Mouse in the West and nobody knows Chubarashka in the West, but Chubarashka was as popular, if not more popular in the Soviet Union than, than Mickey Mouse. And the story, you know, first of all, everyone on that team was a Yiddish speaker. Their families were killed out in the Holocaust. They came, they, it was a safe haven for them in Moscow and Soyuz Monfium. They didn't want to go home to their communalkas where it was like such harsh living. And, uh, and they made this film about this creature, okay, who like the grocer is opening up his, I have, I have props. This is Chubarashka. Okay. And, um, and, and the grocer is opening up his, um, his oranges and he doesn't know what an orange is. And he's like reading, reading the tag and he's like, oranges, you know, and, and it's supposed to be clear that it's foreign. And Chubarashka comes out of it and he's like half bear, half orange. And at that time, uh, you know, everybody knew that the only import that they're getting from Israel is oranges. And, you know, there's many anecdotes told how the grocers were like ripping off the Jaffa orange uh, packaging so that they weren't caught kind of selling, you know, Israeli Zionist uh, fare. And, it, it, it was just like, I am like, oranges are the symbol of, of Israel. And Shibarashka, like, like, they try to find a place for him, but everywhere they go, he's, they say, no, he's, he's this beast of unknown oranges. He, he's not known to science. You know, at the zoo, they say, no, no, he's, he, he can't be classified here. And then, you know, uh, Crocodile Gana, Okay, who works at the zoo as an alligator? Okay, and Kachinov, the director, was like very taken by this that you can work at the zoo as an alligator, right? So, so uh, he 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 looks up Chubrashka in the dictionary, and he gets you know Chubraki, Chibadan, but he can't find Chubrashka, and he says, "No, you don't belong anywhere in the Russian language." 
and so on and so forth. And basically all this creature wants is to belong and to work. And eventually they build kind of illegally, they get together through like Sami's dots, basically. They, they, they write signs and handwriting and then they meet outside of, uh, outside of the Moscow Coral Synagogue. And, uh, and then they go together to Gina's house and, uh, and they build a house of friendship. And that part is like the very sincere part. That's not the comic part. That's what all these directors wanted. They wanted to create a Soviet text where the friendship of the people was a real thing. Right, beautiful, yeah. Uh, it's almost time to go to the Q&A, but I want to uh, ask you one uh, last question before we go there. And uh, if you have questions, please put them under the Q&A box where I will be uh, looking for them. But my uh, final question is about uh, Yuri Norstein's Tale of Tales, which, as you mentioned, is also this week's uh, Women Museum Film of the Week. Um, it has been praised as the most special, the most beautiful animation ever made. Um, it also has a Jewish uh, story to it. What makes this uh, film so extraordinary? <sighs> you left me how many minutes? Okay, well, just in a very <laughs> brief, I yeah. mean, you, ha you have to see the film, that's first of all, but it is nonlinear, it is kind of the full gamut of emotions. You go from like watching the baby nursing them, nursing at the breast, the fallen apples, everything is this very symbolic territory going from one to the other. And you, you basically run the full gamut of emotional responses from the beginning where you think that this horrible, um, horrible uh, lullaby, which all lullabies are horrible, the singing about like this little gray wolf who's going to nip you on the belly and, you know, kidnap you and drop you on the willow, you know, under the willow tree ends up being that it's the wolf himself that's singing it, not the mother. And so like, so, so like all of your perceptions slowly over this 27 minutes completely change where you're just like, you've, you've had like kind of a transformative experience uh, through, and try listening to it without watching it. I think, I think that that experience is really worthwhile because there's some very visceral feelings that are, um, that are evoked in crying babies and slurping sounds from the wolf. And uh, you kind of have to deal with your own disgust and discomfort as you try to make peace with this wolf. So I think it's kind of um, very psychoanalytic, very, uh, and I just want to add like the coolest thing about it is that, you know, in terms of official Soviet art that, Norshin didn't make this as a dissident. He made this as an official artist. And he, he did this in response to the 1976 directive that you should no longer hand in film scripts that are narrative based. You have to fill, hand in film scripts that describe the emotional state you're evoking in the viewer. So that's like perfect in terms of like that he took that and he made a very like like non interpolated I don't know that's like the technical term like not, like like a an independent experience for every viewer. Right. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I can't imagine uh, anyone uh, listening to you right now not uh, taking the opportunity to view the film. So we already have some uh, questions under the q and I would like to start with John Gary. How was Soviet animation distributed and exhibited along with feature films in film festivals, universities, television, film clubs? It depends on what decade, but, but yes, they, uh, you know, in, in the Soviet Union, they had enormous palaces for the theaters. And, uh, and, and often the animations were like kind of the first round. They were the opening acts. Uh, Norstein's film played on a loop for 14 months. And when they decided to take it down, there was like a whole, uh, you know, a whole, whole rebellion. They wanted more. Um, so sometimes like feature films, animations could be shown alone, but for the most part, they would be shown before the feature film. 
And during the age of television, um, of course, they were played basically on repeat. You have to understand that Chiburash, I mean, how many Flintstone episodes do we have? Like 150, right? Chiburash got made four episodes. So everyone knows them by heart. <laughs> you know? wow. uh, all the songs, all the dialogue, you play it out in your school play, you do it again at your youth movement and again, you know, so, so it, it was kind of like, like cultural language. It was, it was, you know, a shared language. Um, and in terms of the film festivals, there were film festivals that, you know, international in Moscow, but for the most part, they were, they were, um, they were international and and some of the uh, directors like Norstein, you know, didn't go. So he won prizes, but, you know, a nice KGB uh, agent picked up the prizes and delivered the speech. Wow. <laughs> Next the question is from Kate Dollemeyer. She writes, thank you for this wonderful conversation. I haven't read your book yet, and I look forward to that. I'm curious to know whether your research also included animation made for educational or industrial films? Were those, those also made in the same studio or was it a separate department as was the case in part, for example, in East Germany? Yeah, well, with that, that department in East Germany, they actually had a connection for some years, Measure Pum. Um, yeah, there were definitely technical films. And, uh, and again, in the, it, before the consolidation of Soviet animation, there were, set, there were absolutely separate departments in all the different films, including in the army. Um, but afterwards, for quite a while, it was, um, it was mostly through Sayusmo film. And there were some television departments that that um, that did you know commercials and things like that as well. So it wasn't like a hundred percent. Right. Thank you, Michael uh, Dooley asks if it would be possible for you to discuss uh, Kitruk's story of a crime, if you are familiar with that. Yeah. Okay, so. I mean, I'm not sure what to describe, what to discuss about that, except for except for the fact that um, that's you know that's kind of a that's a great film to discuss in terms of the creation of a Soviet space. So there's some movies that that I analyzed that were like about the fact that they created an urban space that was all about you know. Um, tolerating neighbors you know even if they were green um and and uh and also just kind of like like not just tolerating neighbors also like if i if i'm remembering correctly also i mean he, 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 i think he kills two of the women that are just really annoying um you know but deservedly so because they were like gossiping and it was just like really annoying and you know he couldn't relax because he had a hard day at work so the whole thing is comic but it's also you know just kind of showing an urban soviet space that was open to all you know you know i don't know if that if that I, I'm sure I do a better job in the chapter. I just don't remember exactly, but I love that film. I love that film. Just, just like how, how you really feel the social life through that whole building, you know, people drinking at night, pushing together the tables, the right. gardening. Thank you. Beautiful. We have an interesting comment here from M. Bobrov Hajal and she writes, Quick comment supporting your point. I was a member of the International Animation Society's New York board in the 1990s, ASIFA East, which was very involved with creating and showing independent animation. Soviet animation was very highly regarded by the entire board and membership. And then, uh, so that's a nice comment. And then we have a question from Thank Rachel you. Darin. That's very generous. After the decline of Soyuz Mood Film, has any comparable state-supported animation studio and or initiative arrived? So that, so, so one of the great things about, I, I don't really, I mean, there, there are studios, there are studios, but one of the great things is that you always hear the complaint with, um, with, with you know, post-Soviet, you know, uh, or Soviet bloc animators that, they wish that the government would support them again. 
um, because, you know, this is very tedious work. It takes years. And without state support, it's almost impossible to do it, especially it takes so many, so many full-time people. And uh and so and so that it kind it kind of goes to my point that there's a Western idea that like the real artist is this dissident artist. Um, but it's just like art historically not true, right? The greatest masterpieces of Western civilization have always been uh supported and patronized by the establishment. And that's what I'm, I'm not saying that there's not real dissident art. I'm just saying that that they're looking for that. They're looking for that support. And um, North Sheen and like about 15 other animators actually signed letter uh, asking Putin to please take over um, their studio. Okay, great. We have um, a comment from Rick Feldman that there actually were 166 Flintstone episodes. So you were very close. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, it really for... matters when you're dealing with animation buffs, it really matters. Right. All, all this stuff, yeah. The next question is from Roman Schneider. And um, he says, I, I heard that Shiburashka was or is very popular in Japan. If so, what's your explanation for that? He's so cute. Yeah. Japan <laughs> loves all things cute. That's first of all. And right. second of all, I mean, it's not just Japan. I mean, the Pope also said that, like, if you, if you want your children to watch something moral, let them watch Soviet animation. You know, it, 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 there there was a sense um, that it's just so adorable. <laughs> you know, it's like so adorable. And there's no there's no like Tom and Jerry beating each other up over the head, and um, and they're looking at real philosophical themes that are. You know, not just for children. You you can really enjoy these as an adult, um, and also just the music is like a very very big piece of it. But also like since I used film hired so many of the theater actors that were pushed out of the Jewish and ethnic theaters. There's like a lot of theatrical pieces to it. it, it you know, there's like a Meyer holding in like style to some to some of the Broomberg sisters uh films and and uh yeah so well I don't think that part is what J Japan is is enjoying I think I think I think it's like all things cute Korea also by the way but yeah thank you thank you um there's one personal message in the Q&A which we will forward uh, to you um I have another question in the meantime, and that is uh, one of the chapters of your book deals with the representation of the Holocaust in animation since the 1970s. Can you say a little bit about how that was done, uh, what the restrictions were there, and also if the animation approach of um, representing the Holocaust actually changed the discussion about the past in the Soviet Union? So before I answer that question, I'll just say that that the Soyuzma Film Studio was um, evacuated one day uh, to Samarkand, where from there they set up shop in Armenian church and they did produce films, which if you like analyze them, again, not, not for hidden content at all, but if you just analyze them from that perspective, so much of it is about being displaced, about being um, considered an outsider. The, the, you know, they do the tale of Tsar Sultan, anyone who's familiar with that from, from Pushkin and Sinbad the Sailor. And if you like listen to like the kind of the, the jokes, but also, but, but also like the, the, the real, uh, the gags, the gag, the animation gags, the trick film, you kind of see like a lot of the, a lot of the um, humor in it is kind of like, you know, sad and, and uh, tragic uh, about their current situation. When they did start making um, films about the Holocaust, they couldn't, they couldn't mention the Holocaust. It, it, none of those scripts got passed. There were many scripts that were offered and only in uh, the 70s do we, well, okay, there, there is a film, Polkan and Shafka, that is about two dogs that I, I think, 
I think uh, that it's about um, citizen collaboration. And if you watch that film, I think it's hard to miss. Uh, the dogs kind of like, one of the dogs uh, is, the, is, is kind of offering herself to the wolves saying, come on, we're almost alike. I'll turn in, you know, the sheep. But, um, but okay, so, so that, that was 1954 or something like that. But the, for example, the Pioneer's Violin, um, I wanna say 1971, is based on a real boy who was um, Avram Pinkinson, who was killed because he wouldn't play the international on his violin. He was a violin protege and he was killed into the mass grave in Kuban. So that, that movie is based on him. And there's another movie, you know, so, so, so there were movies based on real Jewish uh, stories. And then there were movies, uh, and that movie is like horrifying. I remember like, like watching it with my, uh, with my son, who at that time was probably like 14. <laughs> we were both like, we were just both traumatized. Like we didn't think that it was gonna end with this boy actually getting shot into his grave. So it's like very unusual because like people will show concentration camps uh, in the Eastern Bloc because that's not where the majority of Jews were killed. Uh, they were killed in mass graves by, you know, into their mouth, you know, they were shot into mass graves. So, so the fact that he was shot into a mass grave in the, in the film was really shocking. Um, and then there were, there were, oh, Alexander Sudorova, who uh, is the, is the script writer for a story of a doll that takes place in a concentration camp where the inmates make a doll and the doll survives, even though they're all killed out. And when they're liberated, the doll gets saved and it's now in the Auschwitz museum or at least it's really not, but they heard the story that it was mm. in the Soviet Union. And so they made the film about that, kind of the idea of, of art survives. So all sorts of movies that really were looking at, you know, real Jewish stories and, uh, and trying to kind of um, reclaim this, the special uh, experience of Jews during the Second World War. Right, thank you, thank you. We have one more uh, question from Susan Crazen. Uh, she asked, could you say something about interconnections with animators or animation in the satellite countries? Like Estonia and everything. I mean, yeah, there's or so the East Bloc countries, uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. You, like Germany? Like East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, etc. Oh yeah, yeah, no Czechoslovakia, yes. So like, so so not East Germany, def definitely not. Um, that was an attempt in the '30s to to have a joint uh, studio, but th there was absolutely interconnection, and uh, at its certain times, you know, like like the hand, uh, which was a very um, influential film, you know, they were constantly surprising each other. And, and in a sense, it was still hermetic, even though they uh, were in different countries because it was all kind of not Disney. <laughs> the right. same thing is true of animators in New York, by the way. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, 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 they saw themselves kind of connected to the Soviet animators uh, because they were not Disney um and in Canada yeah so right. so that tied them together I mean obviously there's a lot more differences than there are similarities but in terms of like the animation art and I think just in general like animators they're not concerned by all the things that I'm talking about you know they're not you know what 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 artists are concerned about are formal problems and finding solutions to those formal problems. When we talk to an artist, it's like, especially an animator, oh my gosh, you know, when you talk to an, like, like, like they're stuck in an idea on how you make the sunlight be see-through through the figure. <laughs> so, mm. you know, so, 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 you know, this is what ties artists around the world together it, it is when somebody comes up with a technical, you know, kind of like, uh, solution, everyone's picking up on it. Right. 
Okay, well, Maya Balakirsky Katz, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I couldn't be more happy to have you as my final guest in the series. And uh, generally speaking, it has been such a pleasure to do this over 20 months and uh, 53 interviews. I think we have wow. a very special collection together. And if you uh, want to check it out, we have a Vimeo page with uh, all the videos. And oh, I've watched quite a bit. No, I've learned a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we fantastic. also have them in the podcast forum. So whatever works uh, best for you. So in a new year, we will start a new uh, series, a monthly series called In Search of Truth, which is co-organized and co-presented with a student council of eight uh, students. And in times of uh, fake news and alternative facts and the like, we are going to analyze the concept of truth from many different angles and perspectives, including evolution, history, philosophy, art, science, journalism, social media, and more so I hope uh, you will stay uh, tuned in and uh, will follow the new program as well. But before we uh, leave, I once more would like to very much uh, thank our, my dear friends, uh, Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for their more than generous uh, support of this program. They also um, uh, continue uh, trusting our programming and keep supporting us in the new year, which is really fantastic. Rick and Susan, you are truly amazing. And with that, uh, I would like to wish everyone a happy holidays and wonderful start of the new year and hope to see you there. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was great.